Yes, uh, good evening everybody. This is Dimitris Keridis. I'm a member of the Greek Parliament and a professor of international politics uh, in Athens, Greece. But I have been involved uh, since the start uh, with the Thessaloniki International Symposium in World Affairs um, as a founding director of the Navarino ne Network, one of the co-organizers of uh, our um, uh, event. Uh, this is the symposium of the Cultural Society of uh, uh, Entrepreneurs of Northern Greece in Thessaloniki, uh, with the support, the great support of the Adenauer Stiftung and uh, other organizations, I will mention them uh, later. Um, we are delighted that we have managed to overcome all the difficulties of uh, this year with the COVID pandemic, and that we have managed uh, to uh, be okay with our annual um, appointment uh, in the fall of every year since 2012, we have been able to host an international symposium uh, that has to do with what is going on in the world and what are the predictions for the year to come, the world in 2021 uh, this time. This is the ninth symposium. And we have uh, put together a wonderful program of speakers from all over the world, uh, Europe and the United States, starting today with a panel on the pandemic and what it means for the world and continuing for the following three Mondays, the same time, 8.30 uh, Greek time, uh, on the economy, Turkey, and the fourth industrial revolution. You can find all the information about the symposium, including a beautiful agenda with the biographies of all the speakers and the program and all the relevant information on our uh, website, uh, which is uh, www.thessalonikisymposium.org. And of course, this is an event that is uh, broadcasted live through a number of channels, uh, the site, uh, the cultural society sites, the Navarino Network and uh, CAS uh, um, uh, website, and of course, the Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to uh, start with uh, the welcoming uh, remarks of uh, um, our three uh, great uh, uh, guests. I will pass the floor now to the mayor of Thessaloniki, Konstantino Zervas, a dear friend uh, from a town that has uh, been through a lot uh, recently and uh, the pandemic. Uh, Konstantinos has been with us from the very start. He was a deputy mayor back in 2012 when we started these uh, 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 meetings uh, on the centenary of uh, Thessaloniki's liberation from the Ottoman Empire back in uh, 1912. Konstantino, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for your support and the support of TV and FM Ekato, the municipal television and uh, radio uh, station of the city. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my great joy to welcome you to our city, to Thessaloniki, even through this channel, even virtually. I'm pretty happy because this symposium of Thessaloniki, as Dimitri said quite accurately, it is something that we have started together back in 2012 to celebrate the 100 years uh, from the liberation of our city. Nine years later, it has become an institution in our city. This year, of course, everything is different due to the pandemic. This means some added obstacles and uh, make us think that we live in times of uncertainty. The big narration, the big narratives, the safety of uh, the old ages seem obsolete. The speed of evolution and development is quite unprecedented. Challenges are too many and uh, complicated. How one could reply to uncertainty? Do you have any antibodies to fight the situation? And what type of shots, what type of vaccines do we need to become more immune to the decay, decrease and decay? We must not leave the size of challenges to get us paralyzed. We, must, we might not have the safety of the past, but we have a series of assets, which is something stable. The loyalty to human beings, to rational, hope and beliefs due to the advance of the technological development. We are at the dawn of the fourth industrial revolution and we shall be able to listen to that later on. Loyalty and stable preference to democratic institutions vis-a-vis -vis totalitarianism and 
against the very attractive populism that has become a turmoil during the last 10 years, not just in our country, but worldwide. There might be challenges at the world scale, but still we in Thessaloniki, we are here to give local battles. We we're taking care of our neighborhoods, of our city and our country. It's uh, quite important to create some certainties of safety. I'm pretty certain that Saloniki needs infrastructure. We work towards the direction. I'm pretty sure that the implementation of the metro project will revitalize the city, as well as that the new airport will skyrocket our passengers and tourists. Mobility is a main parameter for the development of a city. I'm pretty sure that advancing into the digital transformation of the Saloniki into a smart city that is with a quick pace, we shall reply to a series of problems daily and we shall improve the quality of life for our city. That is why Cisco chose Thessaloniki for the creation of a digital transformation center. Only 15 other metropolis in the world host these centers. Singapore, Milan, Paris, Dubai are some cities that host relevant centers. I'm pretty sure that urban regeneration investments that are planned in the city would benefit our city and thus we can echo to the urban environment all our aspirations and are pretty much sure that the implementation of all these projects may may make the Saloniki a second national development hub and I'm pretty much optimistic that symposia extroversion like the one we're highlighting today will help us towards this direction our own recipe here from the Saloniki is simple. Towards or vis-a-vis -vis uncertainty, we can respond with baby steps and small wins, schedule, persistence, and willingness to do things. I think that this is our vaccine against the prevalence of stagnation, which is much worse than the pandemic. Thank you so much from the depth of my heart, and I wish you all the best mm -hmm. at your personal and collective efforts. And I wish you all, I wish us all next year to see you in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I pass now the floor to Stavros Andreadis, an eminent uh, businessman of uh, Thessaloniki, a very well known. Uh, personality in the north and all over Greece uh, and very much distinguished for his uh, public service. He is the man without whom we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have been here all these past uh, years. He has brought us together, his spirit, his spirit of public service and his energy and enthusiasm. Stavros. Hello, it's my great joy to be here for the beginning of this ninth symposium. I know that hardship that we are all facing make us be present online. I think that our dialogue is going to be equally vivid and useful for this symposium. Of course, it is true at the same time that right now we lack the atmosphere of the eight previous uh, ages, the Olympian theater, the youth, the freshness that exists in the atmosphere, yet we shall overcome. This virtual event, besides here, I would like to thank deeply Mr. Dimitris Keridis, who is the soul of this effort, brings us together with people who are eminent personalities. I would like to thank them deeply because they have the time to be with us and possibly otherwise we wouldn't have the chance to see them live. All four subjects, dear friends, all subjects chosen are critical, I would say, interesting at this time, as we can see a word that changes as we can see, relationship of people that become different. We can see fear, the fear of death, I would say. This fear is here and replaces calmness and replaces a serenity that we had in the past, believing that the, the gift of life was taken for granted. This 
is no valid these days. I believe that we shall listen to very interesting things. From the very first time, we said that this symposium paves the way, opens a window to the world. So this is the window that we have now opened to this year's world. Let us see what is outside that window and let us draw our conclusions by positioning ourselves in this phenomena that we are all living through. Thank you very much, Dimitris. I believe that we shall listen to very interesting things. Thank you. Thank you, Stavros. And I now come to our uh, third um, um, uh, guest to give us uh, uh, the welcoming. Uh, Henry Bonner is the director of the Adenauer Stiftung office here in Athens uh, for Greece and uh, uh, Cyprus. Adenauer Foundation has been with us from the very beginning and uh, has been extremely helpful and supportive of our uh, efforts. We are very thankful and very grateful. And uh, we thank personally Henry for his wonderful cooperation. Thank you, Henry. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitris. Kalispera, good evening from Athens. It's a pleasure to uh, be on the symposium. And it's uh, a pity that we are not in Saloniki, in the beautiful city of Saloniki, where until now we have had many so such successful symposiums. Uh, as I, as uh, Dimitris was mentioned, I'm the director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which is a think tank close to the CDU in Germany, where Angela Merkel right now is our chancellor. And we're cooperating very closely here in Greece with Nea Demokratia, with the governing party right now, because we share the same family in the European Parliament, the European People's Party. We're working together here with politicians, think tanks, and non-state organizations in overcoming our common challenges. And today we're speaking about the biggest challenge we have for decades, for generations. And I'm very much looking forward to hear the experts. That I, that's why I want to stay short. And uh, thank you all for listening in and wishing us all a good discussion. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. And we can now start our uh, discussion by welcoming our uh, two guest uh, speakers, uh, Calypso Nicolaidis and Stephen Walt. If I can uh, have them on the screen, it will help. As we are expecting them to appear, I will make a few introductions. Uh, they are both uh, good friends, people that I have known for years and I have admired uh, very much so and respect their work uh, enormously. Uh, Calypso Nicolaidis uh, is a French Greek uh, intellectual uh, who started um, uh, teaching uh, in France, then in America, and now in Oxford, where she is the professor of international relations and director of the Center for International Studies at Oxford University. She was the founding uh, director of CISOX, a special center for the study of Southeastern uh, Europe, and she has written extensively on uh, European affairs. Uh, she's ideally placed to talk to us about uh, where things stand today with Europe, with Brexit, uh, with the problems of pandemic, uh, with uh, um, uh, Turkey and the rest. And then uh, Stephen Walt, who is the world famous uh, professor of uh, international affairs. Uh, he teaches at uh, uh, Harvard University. Uh, he writes uh, not only um, um, intellectual pieces, but also policy uh, articles for journals, renowned, renowned journals such as uh, Foreign Policy. He's very, very uh, well known. I won't say much uh, for him, uh, about him. You can find uh, the detailed bios uh, on the agenda at thessalonikisymposium.org. The only thing that I was kind of uh, very impressed, uh, we have, uh, I, I will mention, we have recently published an edited volume on uh, the 100 years of international relations uh, since 1919, on the centenary of the founding of the first chair of international relations. And in the introduction, there is a graph where the 10 uh, most influential uh, IR professors and scholars are listed. Stephen Walt, together with some of his colleagues at Harvard, John I, um, and friends like uh, Joe Merschheimer, is listed in the top 10 in the world. Uh, this is about our speakers. Now, because Calypso has a lot of Greek blood, and in Greece we are, um, I feel like she's co-hosting uh, our event, uh, I will um, uh, start with uh, our guest, Calypso, if you uh, uh, want, Stephen Walt. Uh, as uh, we have some really exciting news 
uh, from the United States. Uh, you had your elections, somehow unusual elections uh, and unusual what uh, followed the elections. Uh, it was a headline news all over Europe and here in Greece, and we have been following the latest very closely. Uh, you are going to have a new president in Sims on January 20th, after all. Uh, so I would like your first comments on where is the United States today, where is the world, what is happening in China and the rest, and then I'll pass the floor to Calypso. Stephen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you, and I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, I want to describe how I think COVID-19 will affect world politics and then describe the world order that's going to emerge afterwards. And I'll close with just a word or two about uh, what President-elect Biden is likely to do. Uh, before the pandemic began, several major trends were already happening. Uh, the world was no longer unipolar. We were returning back to a multipolar world with the rise of China the recovery of Russia, and some of the mistakes the United States had made, especially in the Middle East. Uh, the world was already becoming less open due to a broad backlash against globalization. And you see this in the trade wars under President Trump, in the Brexit decision, and the populist opposition to immigration and refugees in many parts of the world. The world was also becoming less free Democracy was in retreat in Russia, in Turkey, in Poland, in Hungary, in Brazil, in many other places. Some might even argue in the United States. And finally, the balance of wealth and power was shifting from the West toward the East. The United States and its European allies were still stronger overall, but Asia was catching up, becoming stronger and richer over time. COVID-19, the pandemic has accelerated all of those developments. Uh, American prestige has suffered because we didn't handle the pandemic particularly well. China didn't handle it well at the start, but now has it under control and its economy is reviving. The world is even less open today. International travel has decreased by 70%. The world economy is in recession. The U.S. and Chinese economies are decoupling, and firms are stepping away from tightly integrated supply chains. The world has also become less free. Governments everywhere have imposed restrictions on their citizens to deal with the pandemic, lockdowns, testing, tracing, greater control over the economy. And I believe some of those controls will not be fully relaxed after the pandemic is over. So, COVID-19 has accelerated a set of trends that were already underway, leading to a world less open, uh, less free than it would have been otherwise. So what's the world going to be like when the pandemic's over? Well, it's not going to alter the basic nature of world politics. Nation states will still be the basic building block, and countries will continue to both compete and cooperate. The defining feature of the future world order will be the between the United States and China. This will be a competition for military advantage, for superiority in advanced technology like 5G and artificial intelligence, and efforts by both countries to expand their influence, especially in Asia, but also in other parts of the world. Europe will still be seen as a valuable American partner but it's going to get less attention than it used to because the United States will be focusing more attention on Asia. The United States is also likely to expect its European allies to support it vis-a-vis -vis China. It's not gonna be possible for Europe to stay neutral and continue to rely on American protection. And the latest EU plan for transatlantic cooperation that just uh, got publicized this week suggests that Europeans understand this. The United States will try to disengage from the Middle East, but it will face enormous pressure from Saudi Arabia, Israel, the Gulf states, and Egypt to continue to confront Iran. And staying out of trouble in the Middle East will be a major challenge for the Biden administration. That's where I wanna end. I wanna suggest there may be a bit more continuity than you might think between Biden and Trump. The style of American diplomacy will be very different, more professional, more disciplined, more businesslike. 
But Biden will still confront China the same way Trump has. He will still be trying to change trade relations with a number of countries. He will still be trying to withdraw from the Middle East. And he will still be pushing Europe to do more to defend itself. But there are two ways this is going to be different. First, Biden will pursue all of those goals in partnership with America's allies, and especially our fellow democracies, instead of trying to do it unilaterally. And second, he will go back to some of the multilateral agreements that Trump abandoned, most notably the Paris Climate Accords, and I believe also the nuclear deal with Iran. But neither of these is going to be easy because he's going to face considerable opposition at home to those initiatives. So his handling of foreign policy will look more familiar, but it will also be the familiar story of facing lots of opposition from the Republican Party. I'll stop there and look forward to hearing what Calypso has to say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Wolf. And now, uh, Calypso Nicolaidis, a good friend, someone who uh, comes from Greece and comes to Greece uh, a lot, uh, who has been uh, following European politics very, very closely. She was a uh, member of the Wise Men uh, EU committee back uh, in the late 2000s um, with under Felipe Gonzalez, if I remember correctly. And uh, she has written extensively on uh, uh, matters uh, that we are all very much interested in. Calypso, the floor is yours. Well. Thank you, Dimitri, and what a pleasure to join you and Steve, old Harvard colleagues uh, tonight, virtually in Thessaloniki, as you know, and as Mayor Zervas and Mr. Andreadis and Mr. Bonner know and should know, Thessaloniki is a city very, very close to my heart. Um, and indeed, when I was in Greece this summer, I was very proud to experience uh, the way in which our country has been a beacon for this pandemic. Um, and that is quite nice as a new normal, as it were, while we live in absolutely abnormal times. And indeed, uh, Steve, I, uh, as you know, usually agree very much with you. And indeed, a bit also on this cynical uh, twist that, well, there will be more continuity than people seem to think around the world with Biden uh, from Trump. But you know what? I believe, Dimitri, that um, hope is humanity's incurable disease, thanks to Pandora. She gave it to us. And um, yes, in 2021, we are going to confront huge challenges, above all, to start to reverse the devastating um, uh, challenge of coronavirus and reversing this. But I think we have very good reasons to be hopeful because yes, we have an anti-COVID but also an anti-Trump uh, vaccine around the corner. Uh, I do think we're moving from making America great again to bring America back at last. Um, and there's much talk of course that this is a reset. Yes, it's a great accelerator as Steve said but also a reset. We are talking if not doing more ethical capitalism virtual democracy, more internationalism. So the question for me, Dimitri, is as we have our conversation, and as you and I always like to say in our good old days to our students, is not whether A will happen or B will happen, but under what conditions? What is the test? How will we know? Um, and indeed, all of these games are interrelated between what is happening globally in Europe, transatlantic, and in our corner of the world in Greece and the East Med, which is attracting so much attention these days, uh, attentions we would prefer not to have. So let me suggest in these few minutes that we need to watch three shifts, three places. The first is the relationship between politics, domestic politics, and geopolitics. Because what Trump has done for us is he has amplified domestic polarization in politics, but also geopolitical polarization with his befriending of autocrats around the world. And those two things mirror each other. So with COVID, we need to ask, how will they continue to relate to each other? And one interesting test for me, Dimitri, I was talking about Greece and the pandemic. You're asking us about the pandemic. 
I think a big difference between countries around the world is between those who have been committed to what we can call the politics of war, politics of war and the theater of war, pandemic is a theater of war, domestically, globally, and those who are speaking more the language of theater of care. I know you just were, were having a dialogue with Angela Merkel. Well, she's much more of the politics of care type, and that's just like Greece. And this will make a difference between countries, but there's much more to say on the relationship between those two fronts, politics and geopolitics. But moving on, the second front, which is going to be, of course, fascinating and important, is to ask whether we are moving back. We've moved in the past, and above all with Trump, from a kind of rule-based global politics to a power-based global politics. And Steve was just talking about this. Now, of course, this predated Trump, but Trump has accelerated this. And one could argue that to some extent, the pandemic has also accelerated this power competition. Um, and you could also note, however, that, well, Biden, yes, Steve, there will be continuity, but for all the reasons you say, Biden will take us back in the direction of a rules base rather than simply power politics, right? We agree on this, the alliance of democracy, getting involved in conflicts, including those in the Middle East or in the South Caucasus, in a way that tries to use international institution and not just carving out more power as Russia and Turkey tend to do. We could give numerous examples. But of course, if we are in a Westless world or in a world where our, the US itself won't have as much power, indeed, as you said, Steve, it's, we cannot rest content to just say, oh, welcome back rules-based world. No, power is there to stay. The power relationship, as you said, Steve, with China is obviously going to be more stronger than ever because we're moving towards the great merger between in China, between China 2025, made in China, a political economy based on authoritarian algorithmic power and the Belt and Road, which is trying to export this logic to the world. And yes, as a European and as a Greek, I believe that we need to continue to engage China, that we can welcome Costco, Coco and, and all of the investment that China is making, including in Greece, but that we cannot be naive. And I know this is a terminology that Greece likes to use these days vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. But Europe has said again and again that it cannot be naive about China. And we will see this happen in the next few years. And indeed, I don't think Europe will uh, willingly choose, Steve, between China and the United States. It will always be closer to the United States, but it will try to keep its guard close to its chest. But this will be the place where things happen. The problem with Europe, and I hope Dimitri will come back to this, is its strategic myopia. Europe is not very good collectively at thinking strategically about the problems of the world and of its neighborhood. Let's hope this will change. But finally, Dimitri, my third point, the third area where I think we need to watch very closely what COVID and the new Biden administration together will do to the world is what I call the necessary pivot from the politics of space to the politics of time. Because you know what? In Greece, we know very well the politics of space. I don't think there is any country in the world whose citizens know better how to measure the six mile and the 12 mile distance to the coast and how we relate to our space and dispute with Turkey. Um, and indeed, we are in a Europe that has been organized around space because that's Schengen, that's creating a one continent. Um, and yet, the real politics that the pandemic has made more visible than ever is the fact that we're living under time bombs. The demographic time bomb in Europe, which calls for better migration policy, the debt time bomb, we have a debt that is almost 400% uh, of world GDP. Um, and of course, the climate time bomb and the sustainability time bomb. And if we're going to deal with this time bomb, we need a new politics, a democracy with the 
long term, a democracy with foresight. I think that's a role the EU can play. It can be the guardian of the long term because it's not very good at short term democracy. And I think, but call me naive, Dimitri, um, I think that Greece has a role to play in reinventing a democracy for the long term. It's a hard democracy, it calls for short term sacrifices, but we can do it. And Greece can think democracy for the long term for all sorts of reasons I have no more time to expand on, but I'm sure we will talk about in the next few, in the next hour. Thank you, thank you very much. You will agree that the Greek political system has not been characterized over the past few decades, at least, for its long-term vision. Uh, it was rather myopic and it uh, got itself into big trouble, as you remember, 10 years ago. Uh, but um, it, 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 it's an uh, optimistic reading of what we can uh, really do. Now, uh, you both reminded me why I have uh, been trying to bring you to Thessaloniki all the past years. And for uh, logistical reasons, it was impossible. Uh, but now, thanks to technology, uh, we can uh, really meet in this uh, truly transatlantic uh, um, uh, meeting from Boston to Oxford uh, to Athens, Thessaloniki and the world. Let me start now with a discussion uh, with uh, um, a few first questions uh, that I have noted here, starting with uh, you, Stephen, if you want. Uh, give us uh, uh, your take on what was, after all, the message of the recent US elections. How would you describe it to uh, an international audience? Uh, what uh, and why did uh, the Americans vote uh, the way they did? Uh, well, uh, we Americans have been spending the last uh, couple of weeks dissecting election results and trying to figure out how we got this uh, somewhat surprising outcome because the polls before the election suggested that there would be an even larger victory uh, for Biden and also a larger victory for the Democratic Party, uh, that they might gain control of the Senate by several seats uh, and that they would make gains in the House. And the unusual thing that happened in the election, and although uh, Trump was clearly defeated, and there's no question about this uh, whatsoever, despite what the president has been saying, uh, the Republican Party did surprisingly well in both the Senate and the House. Uh, we're still waiting for two uh, more uh, elections in Georgia to determine what the balance will be in the Senate. But the Republicans actually picked up seats in the House of Representatives, although uh, they remain a minority. So what I think the easy lesson uh, to this, uh, it, would not, it would not be popular for, for President Trump, was that the election was very much a referendum about him. Uh, that a substantial fraction of Americans who had voted for him or supported him in 2016 did not want him to have another four years. Uh, at the same time, they were convinced that a strong democratic sweep might also lead to policy decisions under President Biden that they didn't want. So you actually had a fair degree of what we call ticket splitting, people voting against Trump for president and then voting for Republicans in other races as well. So I think this was very much a repudiation of uh, Trump's handling of the presidency almost from the very beginning. And if I had to attribute it uh, to one thing, it would be simply that he did not seem presidential. Uh, he seemed undisciplined, uh, dishonest, uh, capricious, uh, could not staff his own administration, kept firing people, kept having people leave office, and Americans were exhausted by this president and wanted to see him go. Uh, at the same time, they were not willing to fully embrace the Democratic Party uh, agenda. So in, a, in an interesting way, I think what, what Donald Trump has to live with is the fact that he lost this election uh, and he lost it himself even though the Republican Party actually did uh, relatively well. Now, if Trump is out, as you say, 
what about Trumpism? I mean, what about what he represented? I mean, is this something of a permanent feature in American politics that we're going to see again uh, uh, in the 2024 election and in the future, or is out and down? Um, it's it's not going to disappear. That's that's quite clear uh, that he will have his supporters. Uh, there's some talk that he may try to uh, sort of run against Biden beginning uh, the day after inauguration <clears throat> and then compete for the presidency again in uh, 2024. But one thing to remember is there are a number of other Republican politicians who would like their chance. Uh, to do it. Uh, it is often rumored, you know, that Tom Cotton, of Arca, Senator from Arkansas, would like to run. Marco Rubio, who has run before, might like to, to run again. Um, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is reputed to have presidential ambitions as well. And none of those people are going to want to sit and wait for four years and let Donald Trump have another shot at, at things. Um, so I think there's going to be a fight for political uh, power, even within the Republican Party. And their big decision is, do they continue to follow the model they have followed in previous years, uh, essentially trying to not to reach out to other Americans, but very much to uh, motivate their own base, a sort of older, predominantly white, predominantly uh, middle class base and really get them energized or do they do what some younger Republicans uh, have been recommending, which is to move away from that model and start trying to reach out to more people in the middle, uh, to more people who are moderates. Uh, under Trump, I don't think that's possible, uh, but under some of the others, you could imagine a Republican emerging uh, that tries to have a broader coalition or broader base of support. Last point I would make is, that much of this is gonna depend on how uh, the Biden administration handles the first year or so they're in office. And uh, my belief is if they can get uh, a vaccine rolled out and distributed to the United States so that normal life resumes within six or seven months, and if that then begins an economic recovery as is very likely, uh, then I think the Biden administration will be in very good shape. They'll have a lot of positive support. They will see, be seen as competent, uh, as a great relief from the chaos of the Trump administration. If they do that poorly, by contrast, then they're going to be in real trouble and they may have real trouble recovering from it. Thank you. Let me just uh, uh, follow up with a final point, a final question on U.S. politics to put it behind us. It has been on the news uh, uh, a lot uh, the last uh, uh, month for sure. Uh, and uh, kind of focus on the foreign policy. You make some references to the continuities and discontinuities of uh, the new administration. Uh, how much of a Obama restoration is the new Biden team? Uh, this is a question here in Europe. And more broadly, uh, apart from the gossiping and the who is who, et cetera, how much do you think, um, you know, the, uh, let me, for absence of a better term, use the word, the liberal establishment uh, in Washington has learned the lessons from the mistakes of the past I'm referring to, uh, you know, uh, the hawkishness, whatever, you, you name it. Um, and uh, is, uh, is um, determined not to repeat them uh, today. How optimistic you are. Ah, that's, it's a perfect question. Uh, there's, there's no question that they're bringing the Obama team back. Uh, they're getting the Obama band back together. Uh, these are all people who uh, have served in previous administrations. They have a lot of experience. Uh, they um, uh, like each other. They get along well with each other. It's a very coherent team. And thus far, there's no one sort of outside the foreign policy mainstream. They like our alliances. They like democracy. Uh, they like free trade. They like, uh, you know, within certain uh, parameters, they believe in human rights in ways that the Trump administration did. So this is a very familiar no surprises, uh, mainstream conventional group. The question you ask is exactly the right one and only time will tell. To what extent did they learn from the mistakes that were made under the Obama administration? Have they learned that intervening in a place like Libya only makes things worse? 
uh, have they learned that trying to do social engineering in a place like Afghanistan or Syria isn't likely uh, to work particularly well? And even if you've learned that lesson, can you resist the temptation to try and do something when some unexpected event happens in some part of the world? Can you resist it when an ally says they are losing confidence in your pledges and they want more support and you don't think they deserve uh, more support, things like that. That's when we're gonna discover how much they've really learned. I think the one place where it is clear that the Biden administration will differ from Obama and Bush and Clinton before them is the commitment to what I would call hyper-globalization the commitment to sort of letting markets determine uh, everything in terms of international trade and finance, trying to lower barriers in lots of ways. Uh, they've made it clear, I think, throughout the campaign that although they still believe in free trade, they do not believe that can be done in quite as rapid or enthusiastic a fashion as it was done in the past. That countries have to be protected, workers have to be protected from some of the pressures of international competition. Um, that's the one place where I expect them to be different. But on the rest of it, uh, I, I don't have uh, enough confidence to believe they've really learned their lesson. So I'll be, I'll be interested to see if they can be more restrained than they were in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Let me now uh, pass to Calypso and ask Calypso, since you are talking to us from uh, uh, Britain, um, what is still the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, a question about Brexit. Uh, if um, we are done with uh, too much drama we had in Washington, it seems that Britain has been producing its own uh, uh, big drama the last uh, uh, few years. And I wonder if we are heading for a crescendo by the end of the year when uh, uh, officially uh, the UK is uh, out. Uh, what is your take? What is your prediction? Uh, what do you think about Brexit? Well, Dimitri, you're absolutely right that Britain has been very generous in producing <laughs> drama, and it has gone all the way. While in Greece, we've talked so much about Brexit, uh, they've done it. And uh, indeed, in, in this country, it feels where I'm speaking from in Oxford, um, we are reminded of this all the time. Britain is out um, and in the mindset is very important because everything Steve was talking about here is echoed by, you know, where will global Britain, the phrase that is preferred by this government, uh, fall um, in these calculations? Um, and while it, many repeat that, well, the best way for Britain to keep influence is still um, influence in Washington is to, first of all, ensure a deal. Um, they're not convinced. But I would, you ask me where you think we will fall. I have predicted from the beginning that there will be a deal. Why? Because, you know, I'm a very hardcore realist about these issues. Um, there are structural economic interests on both sides to reach a deal. Uh, Britain is expected to lose 5% of GDP um, in a steady state. Uh, from Brexit, but with no deal Brexit, it's 78% from its own government uh, evaluation. So the structure is there. All the economics actors are saying it. The, the idea of queues and in Kent and all the rest of it, uh, lorries and, um, and paying tariffs on imported goods, it's not a nice thought. But of course, the question is whether the red lines that are defined by politics could prevail probably by accident uh, because each side stubbornly sticks to them. And you know, there are two kinds of issues that we're still discussing and I believe will be resolved in the mid-December in the next European Council, probably with a phone call or a series of phone calls between Macron and Boris Johnson. There are the issues that are linked to the fact that they're stakeholders. Um, Fishing is the biggest example, very, very small, 0.1% of GDP, but there are important electoral levers in both sides. And of course, for Macron, vis-a-vis um, -vis Le Pen, vis-a-vis -vis the right wing, there are important um, um, challenges there. So they cannot be seen 
to make compromise. And what will happen there is the classic thing. We know it in Greece, kicking the can down the road. The Brits are going to offer a gliding, very, very soft landing, and we will revisit in four years' time. But most importantly, the other kind of issues is something, of course, Greece also cares about, so-called level playing field, or the idea that Europe is scared, worried, let's put it that way, with unfair competition, because Britain refuses in the name of sovereignty to commit to ratcheting, to to continue to improve its standards in parallel to the EU. The EU has become realistic. It's not asking for cut and paste, copying EU standards, but it says we should continue to have similar standard on environment, labor, and subsidies and competition law. And well, you know, um, I think that the EU is both right and wrong in this. It's right because you don't want unfair competition. You want to show the world that in Europe we don't have unfair competition when you want to tell China not to subsidize irresponsibly. But on the other hand, it is also partially wrong because you know what? Britain is not going to lower its environmental standard. It's going to pre preside over COP26 next year. Um, it's going to um, not have enough money to subsidize its industry um, without control. So I think I, here again, to a great extent, there is a place for the rest of the EU and the UK to land um, and to really kind of set the floor for the future relationship, which will still need to be negotiated in the next few years. So we won't be done by January 1st, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned Macron, and uh, I want now to turn to the country uh, where uh, you were born and raised, uh, a country that we Greeks always loved but has become particularly popular here in Greece uh, recently, especially France and especially its, its president, President Emmanuel Macron. And you refer to geostrategic Europe, um, a Europe with a voice, and this seems to be the French vision, the Macron vision. Uh, I would like you to help us uh, uh, decipher um, uh, the French code and understand what is happening in uh, France uh, today. Where does France uh, stand vis-a-vis -vis Germany, vis-a-vis uh, -vis this geostrategic Europe, vis-a-vis -vis its role in the near abroad of Europe in the Mediterranean and in the East, France? These days, it's not bad to be Franco-Greek, I have to say. Our two countries um, are definitely working together vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Um, I think France and Macron has wanted to uh, play a leadership role for Europe. It can't really do it on the economic front, on the Eurozone, a front uh, dear to Greece, I say with irony, um, for good reasons, that France is not in a great place uh, in terms of debt and all the rest of it. But um, geopolitically, of course, once Britain is out, here were the two countries that had a claim to a solid um, policy um, in the security field. In fact, they will continue to cooperate um, after Brexit is uh, dusted. Um, and so France is the country now, which in Europe represents a geopolitical vision. And this is a France that therefore um, wants to make sure that the rest of Europe follows its vision. And its vision includes um, speaking about something that Macron has referred to as European sovereignty in a really paradoxical way because he, um, he's a, also a French nationalist, unsurprisingly, he's, he's goalist in many different ways. But you know, like all the French tradition, it's always about if the moment you think these days Europe will be a big France, will speak the voice of France, then you're not too scared of speaking about European power. Um, if, if Germany reasserts itself, now it's being quite silent on the global front, you know, France and, and controls more of Europe, France will uh, retreat in speaking about European sovereignty. But you, we could say that um, it is not a bad thing. We have to think through in the European Union something that is oddly called open strategic autonomy, whatever that means. But it, it tries to say that we need to reassert regain control, you know, the fifth slogan of the Brexiters taking back control. 
Well, Europe needs to do it also in this Hobbesian world. Um, and we are trying to express that we will still be faithful to ourselves by remaining open while repatriating supply chain and having a strategic vision in the world. It's a lot of balls to juggle, but France is trying to juggle these balls these days, as you know very, very well in a Greek public, vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, um, because of course it's much less um, fearful than Angela Merkel and Germany of uh, Turkey breaking its commitments on refugees that it has made vis-a-vis -vis the EU. So, France, so that explains in part the difference between France and Germany um, in dealing with Turkey, in, in Germany being much more cautious. But also France has been very clear for many years that it was opposed to um, being too generous on Turkey's relationship with the EU. It used to be about membership. This is long gone, but even more generally, even though they're old friends. Um, and so it's not surprising that France has really been behind Greece in the kind of conundrum and, and uh, ship saga around Cyprus in the last few weeks and months. And I have no doubt it will continue to do so and preach the case of Cyprus and Greece in the European Council in being tough with Turkey, in using sanction vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, um, it will pursue that route because France believes that Europe, including France, of course, needs to be present in the East Mediterranean and needs to demonstrate that the first imperative is solidarity, geostrategic solidarity in this case. Thank you, Caleb. So I will come back to uh, Turkey and the Middle East uh, at the last part of our discussion, but thank you for these uh, uh, first uh, comments, uh, which are very true uh, as far as Merkel is concerned in our uh, discussion this morning, uh, me representing the Greek parliament. Uh, she being the president of the EU for this uh, semester, after castigating Turkey mildly, uh, she did not uh, fail to mention how grateful uh, she is and we all should be for Turkey's handling of three million plus uh, refugees from uh, uh, Syria. So this refugee issue is very uh, big on her mind uh, for sure, in a way that it is not for Macron. Let me go back to Stephen now. Uh, Dimitri, I can't resist saying that I'm very glad you were there in the parliament virtually to uh, push the case of Greece here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, uh, Stephen, let me broaden our uh, focus again before closing in and zooming in the Mediterranean and the Middle East and uh, go, of course, uh, back to the big elephant in the room, which is China. Now, you are in a building with some uh, other eminent scholars of international relations who have not failed to write about China recently and write about it contradicting in a contradictory way. So let me ask you, where do you stand? On the one hand, you have John Ai, uh, a, a dear friend and a famous scholar, uh, who thinks that the rise of China, to put it uh, schematically, uh, might be a little too exaggerated. That uh, in the past, we had uh, uh, the Soviet right, rise in the 50s, which did not, did not materialize, the Japanese rise in the 80s, we know where Japan is today, and that China, at some point, it will level off. And then, of course, we have Graham Allison with his book on Thucydides' trap, which we have just recently translated into Greek, uh, uh, who is uh, very um, alarmist about the rise of China. How big is that rise? How, I mean, let's put it on, 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 on uh, measure it before I ask you uh, how to deal with it. Uh, what is your position? Uh, I would probably, you know, at the risk of seeming like I'm compromising, I might put myself somewhere in between uh, the two. Uh, there's no question that China's rise is extraordinary. Uh, in 1978, the per capita income of China was roughly $150 a year, you know, per person, and now it's well over $10,000 a year. That's still substantially lower than the United States, most of Europe uh, in terms of per capita income. Uh, but to move that far, that fast is truly extraordinary. And they're not showing uh, dramatic signs of slowing down. Yes, they have slowed down some, but they're continuing uh, to grow. 
And it is worth noting that China of the major economies is the ones that is coming out of the pandemic uh, most quickly, which will uh, both uh, you know, be good for them economically and in terms of overall power, but it's good for their reputation that they were able to deal with this in ways that the United States, that the United Kingdom, uh, some other countries uh, were not. Uh, they also are very serious about trying to uh, be the world's best in some critical areas of technology, whether it is 5G wireless or whether it's artificial intelligence, uh, and they are in a position to make, I think, a serious run at being, if not the world's best, at least very close to the world's best in those areas. So I don't think one can simply say, uh, you know, this is not something to take uh, seriously. And when you couple that with their own declared ambitions, what they have said they would like to do, and what I think their overall strategic interests are, it's, uh, it's clearly a competition that you have to take seriously. That said, I think it is a competition that uh, the United States and its partners can win or at least can protect our own interests within it. The United States still has far greater set of allied support. Uh, countries in Asia in particular are increasingly alarmed uh, by China's rise, increasingly interested in cooperating uh, with the United States in a variety of ways. You see diplomatic arrangements like the so-called Quad of India, Australia, Japan, and the United States taking on uh, more substance as well. And I think that process is likely to continue uh, and may very well succeed. To me, the real challenge going forward is how one competes with China effectively, while at the same time cooperating in the areas that we should cooperate, for example, climate change, preparing for the next pandemic, things like that. And finally, also encouraging China to make some of the changes it needs to make to correct some of its economic practices that are in violation of the commitments it made to the World Trade Organization when it joined. So we have areas where we're just gonna compete and it's gonna be purely competitive, but there are other areas where we need to be able to work with Beijing and try and get them to adjust their behavior in certain ways um, and in other areas to cooperate more directly uh, with us. I think the Trump administration failed not by not taking the China challenge seriously, but by trying to do it all unilaterally. And I, I am hopeful that the Biden administration's approach will be to confront China intelligently in partnership with other like-minded countries, and there are a lot of them, now, while at the same time sending a message to Beijing that on some areas, we want to be able to cooperate with you as well. That's, in a sense, normal great power statecraft. Uh, I could insist uh, on China if we had the time, but let me now uh, turn to the issue of democracy. Uh, we all know that uh, America, uh, throughout the Cold War and uh, after 89 even more, preached democracy, but acted in a much more realistic way. I wonder how worried should autocrats uh, be, uh, friends and allies of the United States, and I'm referring specifically to the uh, Saudi uh, 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 um, uh, prince, um, uh, MSB, or uh, to Al-Sisi in Egypt, or even to Modi, you refer to India, um, and obviously uh, the big autocrat, uh, uh, Tayyip Erdogan, as uh, Biden himself called him uh, before uh, the elections. So uh, is there going to be a democratic agenda in the foreign policy of uh, United States, or is it just a rhetoric? Uh, I think, I, I'm sorry to say, I think it's going to be mostly rhetoric, but not entirely. Uh, certainly, uh, someone like Mohammed bin Salman is not going to get the blank check that he effectively got in the administration, where autocrats and not just uh, MBS, but autocrats MBS. elsewhere were largely given a free pass, if, if not even actively supported. Uh, so Trump was, you know, very popular in Poland, which has been moving in an illiberal direction, very popular with uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, very popular with Bolsonaro in Brazil, a series of populist leaders, whether democratically elected or not, 
clearly not strongly committed to, to a sort of traditional democratic norms. And I, I would even add uh, Prime Minister Modi in India, who's again, democratically elected, but has adopted some policies that are not consistent with sort of traditional uh, liberal values. The free pass that all of them got under Trump is probably going to be over. Um, and it, but then, having said that, you know, what, how far will the Biden administration be willing to push it? Are they really going to put pressure on uh, Mohammed bin Salman to end the war in Yemen? Are they going to cut off all ma military support uh, for Saudi Arabia? I rather doubt that. And the critical test will be when Biden uh, forms the so-called summit of democracies that he has said he wants to organize in the first six months that he's president, who does he invite, All right? So it's obvious he would invite Greece, he would invite uh, Great Britain, he would invite France, he would invite Germany, he would invite Japan. But what about some of the, uh, the other ones as well? Does he invite Poland, Hungary, Turkey? Uh, India, et cetera, Israel for that matter, all of them democratic in some sense, but all of them with significant liabilities as democratic states. If the guest list is big, that suggests it's mostly rhetoric. If the guest list is very small, that suggests that they're really taking those liberal values very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Calypso. Let's go back to Europe, where can I, I've... Can I yes. just... Uh, yes, of course. Just, just to react, um, um, first of all, on China, to um, take this, m many of us have Steve's uh, balanced stance, um, but I think we need to kind of stress the, the bigger story of technology, not just 5G, but the race between the United States and China on the quantum computing, on big data, on how this will fuel the surveillance state in China and who gets there first will be very, very important. You know, will dwarf many of the issues we are talking about today. And in this picture, we can ask as Europeans, Steve, you were saying, well, Biden, will there be transatlantic um, alliance vis-a-vis -vis China? And of course, Europe will hesitate to go all the way. Uh, we, Europe will try to continue to be much more balanced. But it's important for us in Europe to stress that um, we remain divided, but in a different way vis-a-vis -vis China. For many, many years, the divide in Europe was that the southern countries like Greece were um, wary about China. China was competing with them, but the north, uh, northern countries were resisting um, um, moving. Uh, but now, of course, this has kind of been reversed. And the South, we see Greece with, um, and the 17 plus one group is East Central Europe and the South want to work with China, uh, but the North of Europe uh, wants to be tougher. And so it's kind of an, a reversal of alliances in Europe. And this politics, what I wonder about, Steve, I don't know, but how the Biden administration will kind of play into that into those divisions in Europe. That will be very important to watch. And, you know, and, and, and on, on democracy, yes, absolutely. Um, we will have um, a, a big test in the Middle East. Um, but I, I think it's not just a matter of uh, idealism or supportive democracy in general that uh, we can, you know, trust Biden to have this commitment, even if it, he'll have a lot of pushback from arms sales, etc., but also because it's basically in the U.S. interest to push back against, you know, alliances between Russia and the Emirates and their mercenaries in Libya and elsewhere that are destabilizing, you know, North Africa, the Middle East, and, and the ally Euro Europe. So um, that's where support, uh, start stopping to support autocrats and hardcore strategic interests, you know, come together for the U.S. and Europe. Sorry, Dimitri, I didn't... No, no, that's wonderful. But let me come uh, back to my question, which has to do with uh, the double failure uh, we are confronted in Europe. On the one hand, in Eastern Europe, we have a certain challenge, let me put it mildly, of uh, the rule of law. And uh, I wonder your take on Hungary, Poland, and their resistance to the new mechanism proposed 
uh, to check abuses uh, on uh, democracy and the rule of law. And then we have the other failure in Southern Europe, uh, in places especially like Italy, but not only, Greece included, that have failed to converge with uh, uh, the North economically. So we have an economic failure in the South that is aggravated by demography, and we have a democratic failure or whatever uh, challenge uh, in the East. Uh, and uh, I wonder, where do we stand today? Do you share the optimism of people like Ivan Krastev, who wrote that with the defeat of Trump, uh, populism in the post-COVID uh, era uh, will be down and we will see more of uh, the Merkel type of leaders, as you mentioned before, the caring, the caring type, or uh, we are not done with, uh, uh, with that? Um. I'll, I'll speculate here. I, I think there's no question that uh, if Trump had been reelected, uh, this would have been uh, something that bolstered the position of uh, of the European populace as well. And you could even uh, say that the other European politician who was not happy uh, a day or two after the U.S. election was probably Boris Johnson, who has a certain amount of of you know sort of Trump light in him as well. Uh, but the forces that drove populism uh, and those movements in Eastern Europe were not, they didn't begin with Trump. These were po political leaders who had emerged within their own political systems long before Donald Trump uh, ran for president. And I don't think the forces that have made Orban popular in Hungary, and he has been popular, uh, that have made the Law and Justice Party popular in Poland, and it has been popular in Poland, those forces are not going to disappear just because Americans voted a different way, and it will continue to be a major problem for the European Union. I, I believe Europe will continue to, let's say, uh, exert less influence on the world stage than it otherwise could, precisely because it has to spend so much time dealing with internal problems or the consequences of things like Brexit. Uh, and that makes it harder for Europe to speak with a unified voice uh, or to have a unified position uh, in international affairs. Stephen, that was a question for Calypso, but it's nice that you uh, interfere. I want to keep you for one last question before we close. So let me have the take of all these, the economic failure in the South, the democratic challenge in the I, East from Calypso. I, I, um, I mean, I, I, Steve responded as I would have on populism. It, it's, it's here to stay because it takes its root in people's sense of themselves in their identity and it gets entrenched. Uh, we are in a politics of polarization everywhere where even though, you know, as individuals, we might be ambivalent about things. We might like cooperation and control, but we have leaders who tell you, no, our countries need to control. We need to control our borders. We need to reinvent a new national narrative. And, and people get entrenched in these political logic because they have much less other social identities as they used to have. Anyway, it's a long story. How the EU then addresses issues and does not overreach becomes very important for how likely populism continues to be. And in this sense, your question, Dimitri, was really to some extent about an interesting shift in Europe today because in Greece, we have experienced for 10 years, hard, harsh conditionality linked to macroeconomics, linked to the economics of a country. And it looks as though um, the European Union has kind of um, stopped being so, um, so harsh on this kind of conditionality. It happened before COVID, because it re realized how counterproductive it was going to be. And with COVID, there is much less fear in the north of this kind of being a free rider, much less accusation. You know, mm -hmm. COVID is false from the sky for all of us. So there's much more solidarity. So this kind of Eurozone, for the moment, Eurozone conditionality is quietened. But at the same time, there is now a heightened conditionality on rule of law uh, with the East, as you were saying, Dimitri, it's an old story. We've been talking about it ever since Orban came to power. And in fact, 20 years ago with Austria, um, how, how are you a faithful member 
of the EU. You have to be a democracy, rule of law. This was unspoken. When Greece became a member, it was because it had become a democracy. But of course, what's happened in, in East Central Europe now makes this a kind of issue where everybody's asking, is it fair that these leaders reinforce their grab, their power grab, thanks to European monies that might amount to five, six, seven percent of their GDP? And it's fair enough. I think a majority in Brussels now agree that to make the disbursement and spending of EU money conditional on rule of law. But the big debate is how far do we go? And the, those conditions, do they pertain to how you use the specific funds to make sure it doesn't go in somebody's pocket who is a friend of Orban? Or do they have to be much more generic conditions linked to what is happening mm. in the judiciary? And you know what, Dimitri, this debate is with us to stay. It's going to continue. It will be resolved by a fudge in the next few days, um, in the next council, but it will be with us for years to come, years to come. Thank you. We have uh, a very little time left. Uh, just for one question, as I'm trying to zoom in our region now, uh, and I'll go to Stephen. I know he has a class to teach uh, uh, in a few minutes. So we are on time, we are fine. We are gonna have a special session on Turkey two Mondays from today. But uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, there is a Middle Eastern crisis, uh, a remaking, uh, a re reshaping of the Middle East with all the civil wars going on and two camps fighting on the one hand, the Turkey-Iranian-Qatar, one might say, axis, and then the westernizers, the westerners, uh, the monarchies of the Gulf, uh, Egypt, Israel, Greece, Cyprus, France, etc. So there, there, there are some, kind, I mean, you see that in Libya, you have seen that elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, I would like, uh, Stephen, with, uh, um, uh, with your great experience, uh, to tell us uh, where we stand there and finish with a recommendation, if you can. If you were in the Greek prime minister's office, oh, of course, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, you will need to know uh, maybe all the details, but uh, uh, with everything you have written and read all these past years, what would you advise um, uh, a, the, the top Greek policy maker uh, to do when uh, looking out in this very insecure uh, environment around uh, the country, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey in particular. Okay, so I'll say three things. Uh, what, uh, what should happen in the Middle East, uh, what the United States should do, uh, what the United States is going to do, and then I'll answer your question and I'll do it all in two minutes. Uh, what, the United <laughs> States, what the United States should do is it should be uh, taking a much more detached role in the Middle East. Our main goal is to make sure that no country is able to dominate that region. And the fact that there are now lots of countries contending for power there in different sides is actually not a problem for the United States. We should be playing a balance of power game. We should not have special relationships with any countries in the region, and we shouldn't have no relations with any countries in the region. We should be talking to everyone. Uh, there. Uh, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, what we will do, of course, is we will continue to support uh, the traditional set of allies we have had there, uh, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the Gulf states, because these states are all very influential in Washington, D.C. And so we have a completely distorted understanding of what our real interests are uh, in, in the region. Uh, the advice I would give to, to Greece... You have written a famous, controversially famous book on but, that... Uh... But to be clear, it is not just the Israel lobby. There are other groups working through think tanks as well. So it's Obviously, not, it's which not was a cura courageous book. Agree or disagree, it was a cu courageous book. Okay. I followed the whole story when I was there. Let me just tell you that I'm the head of the Israeli friend Friendship Committee in the Greek Parliament. So I take the word very seriously. Good. Uh, so the advice I would give to the, uh, the Greek prime minister is very general, and that is to say that if you are a country like Greece, uh, you need friends. Uh, and it's very important for Greece to remain on good terms with as many countries as possible, 
uh, given the challenges that uh, Greece faces, uh, that involves first maintaining very active and close diplomatic ties with all of its European uh, Union partners, uh, continuing to cultivate the relationship with the United States, which has generally been a warm and close one. Uh, but you know, if, if there's one thing that political realism, which you could argue maybe began in Greece uh, with uh, some of the writers uh, long ago, uh, that you know, when you're a relatively small state, it's very hard to do, go it alone, and therefore you need friends. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, uh, Calypso, you have the last word. Well, I mean, Turkey I, is made the Middle East, Greece. Who could disagree with Steve? Uh, Greece needs friends, and it, it's, um, it's quite good these days, as you were just pointing out, Dimitri, at making friends. Indeed, um, but friendships um, in the international arena are not quite like friends in the real world, as we all are. Um, and between individuals, They're, they have to be based on hardcore convergent interests. And so how Greece thinks through its interlocking friendships, especially in the, in the Mediterranean and in the East Mediterranean, will be fascinating. It's right now, it's done this deal with um, Egypt to counter Turkey on the division of uh, exploration rights um, in the East Med. Um, that is important. But let's remember for all of these countries' sake that in fact, gas, gas is not going to be a very profitable long-term long export from the region. It's not the gold pot that everybody seems to think, except if you're using it locally. So we have the irony of Greece building these um, alliances and, and but on the basis of a tension with Turkey and tension in the region and Syria were gonna come in come back into this picture, um, where the underlying struggle, because they're always underpinned by economics. In the old times, it was oil, energy politics is critical. Greece needs to, in addition to being a realist um, in this region, in the Mediterranean, really bet on the politics of the future, of being autonomous from the calculation. Greece can really be a leader in renewable energy, whether it's wind or sun, that will do more for Greece geopolitically than all the kind of gas exploration. I'm not saying Greece should give up, of course, on defending Cyprus and its economic zone. Uh, I'm not saying Greece should not uh, resist um, Turkey's provocation in the region, but it all, Greece should actually calm down the atmosphere. Um, it has more stake in doing that than many other countries because it's at the center of these various fronts, Mediterranean, the East and the Caucasus. We haven't even talked about Nagorno-Karabakh and the, the whole proxy games that Russia and Turkey are playing. So Greece needs to be more autonomous and push back against this geopolitics of fear and try to spell out some sort of geopolitics of hope in the region. Um, so this is me perhaps being naive, but based on hardcore uh, economic calculations. So this is my wish for the future of Greece, being a leader um, in the new politics of the 21st century. Thank you, thank you. We will uh, look at this matter next week with our economists uh, in the panel. Uh, Nicolas Vetas is co-chairing the uh, reform committee that the Prime Minister has put together for the COVID, post-COVID uh, uh, developmental uh, uh, trajectory of uh, Greece, together with Daniel Gross, a good acquaintance of yours from SEPS in uh, Brussels. So let me thank you both very, very much uh, for this wonderful discussion. Very, very productive. It has been followed by thousands here in Greece and abroad. Uh, it has been videotaped and will be available online uh, for the generations to come. Uh, let me uh, wish you uh, uh, good luck and hope to be able to welcome you live in Thessaloniki uh, in some of our future uh, meetings in 21, 22, 23. Uh, I'm sure we will have a lot to talk about. 
Uh, let me thank all the sponsors and friends who made this uh, uh, possible. I'm referring uh, to the individuals from Pandelis, Vicky, uh, George, Angelos, Lola, Lefteris, and all these wonderful people who have put together this organization, and obviously the Cultural Society of Entrepreneurs uh, of Northern Greece, uh, Adenauer Foundation, um, Affixes, and the American College of Thessaloniki, our media sponsors, um, in uh, the city of Thessaloniki and Kathimerini uh, here in Athens. And let's renew our meeting for next Monday, December the 7th at 8.30, uh, live again uh, to talk about the uh, global recession and the Greek economy, um, the fiscal pressures, the developmental challenges uh, that uh, we will face in the uh, post-COVID world. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Calypso. Have a very good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.